Having started all the way back in September, American Horror Story Delicate lasted almost as long as an actual pregnancy, and it has not been a smooth journey to say the least, but after a couple strong episodes towards the end that detailed the history of this immortal coven, it became clear that a lot of us had underestimated the potential this season actually had. Unfortunately though, a lot of that potential went out the window for a lot of us fans when we found out that the runtime for the final two episodes would hover around 30 minutes, with episode 8 clocking in at 34 minutes, and the season finale breaking the record for the shortest episode of American Horror Story ever, with just 31 minutes. These short runtimes have been a problem that AHS has been experiencing for at least its past three seasons, it's been a consistent trend that as those seasons go on, the runtimes consistently dwindle, and this tends to result in the endings of those seasons feeling rushed, unfinished, or confusing. And that's exactly how I felt about the finale of Delicate. I wanted the season so badly to live up to its potential, and I was sorely disappointed on Wednesday night when the finale fell into so many familiar pitfalls that finales of the past have also fallen into. That being said, do not let my opinion tarnish yours if you did enjoy the finale and the season as a whole. As always, opinions are subjective and mine is not more correct than yours and vice versa, but this is just how I felt about this episode. So what do I mean when I say the finale fell into familiar pitfalls of AHS past? It's got the runtime of NYC's finale, the evil monologue, exposition dumps of both double features finale. It largely takes place in weird monochrome liminal spaces, not dissimilar from Death Valley. It sets up an all-powerful villain that is surprisingly taken out very easily, much like in Apocalypse, and it ends with the main character donning the headwear of one of the season's villains, just like the ending of Colt. On the surface, these similarities are not bad things, but unfortunately there's just not much else to this episode, and the whole season was building up to a 30 minute long finale that mostly consists of Kim Kardashian evil monologuing to Emma Roberts, who is forced to just react in shock and anger for every scene in the episode. I don't know how I could ever be satisfied with a finale that simply tells us what's going on rather than showing us, especially when it comes just to episodes after Ave Hestia, which honestly gave us more answers and was a much more satisfying episode than this episode was. And that's because throughout Delicate, the strongest point of the season for me have been the flashbacks. The Queen Mary flashback from episode 4 is truly what hooked me on the season, as before that point, all we had really seen were hallucinations from Anna's perspective. And when episode 7 gave us a full break from that perspective, it resulted in the strongest episode of the season. Season. So the fact that this episode consists of two underwhelming flashbacks that only shed light on how Anna and Siobhan met and how Dr. Hill got involved with Siobhan's schemes, I was definitely left wanting more considering those were not the questions that I wanted answered in this episode. Instead, I would have loved to see the rituals that Cora alluded to Dr. Hill having in the last episode, or show us how Siobhan and the witches killed Babette or Hamish in order to ensure Anna has a successful awards campaign, or give us more insight into these other witches as individuals. I feel like I know next to nothing about Nicolette, Talia, and the Ashleys. And another thing that they could have explored through the flashbacks is what function exactly did the dolls serve? They left that completely unanswered in the finale as well. But back to Babette and Hamish, it, and also Virginia, it just really stinks that a lot of the major deaths in this season that didn't happen in this episode were completely off screen. I thought for sure they were going to give us flashbacks of how all three of those characters died, but instead we're just left to assume what happened. In my review for episode 7, I said I worried that this season could all be leading up to another American Horror Story super baby in reference to how Murder House, Apocalypse, and Death Valley all culminated in the births of some sort of all-powerful baby. My wording it of AHS Super Baby was a joke, but this episode actually referred to the Coven's babies as super-powered babies, which I just found pretty funny considering that I was pretty close to the actual truth of the situation when I was joking about the Baby Avengers two episodes ago. But of course the season did not end with Anna's baby being that super baby, as Adeline Spell seems to have reversed whatever was going on there, and Anna has a completely human baby at the end of the 
the season. On the one hand, I am glad that this season did not leave us with another unresolved super baby in the AHS universe like so many other seasons, but on the other hand, the way this all happens in the episode felt like a cop-out. To put it plainly, the episode boils down to Siobhan leaving Anna alone in a room for about 20 seconds, and that is when the ghost of Adeline shows up and begins chanting her Ave Hestia chant, which Anna chants along with. When Siobhan returns to the room, she immediately freezes in place and and start shaking before she dies a very Voldemort death. So Siobhan, the all-powerful supreme puppet master who has been influencing the world for thousands of years, dies in this episode because the girl she's been gaslighting for the past couple of years and the ghost of a witch she killed chanted something at her. So if these witches still retain their magical powers when they die and they can somehow travel without any limits, why would Siobhan kill Adeline? because to me it seems by killing her, Siobhan essentially made Adeline a bigger threat and more powerful than her. I just think it doesn't make much sense and it feels like this finale was not thought out. So they took the easiest route to kill their villain, which also feels like exactly what happened in the Apocalypse finale. When it was announced last year that Hallie Pfeiffer would serve as the sole writer and showrunner for AHS Delicate, I was on one hand looking forward to a new voice in the writer's room, but I was also wary of her seemingly being the only member of that writer's room, as the last time we had a small writer's room was AHS Double Feature, which was a low point for the series. And sadly, this season ended up having a lot in common with Double Feature. I mean, they are the only seasons to be split into two parts, and all three narratives, uh, so Red Tide, Death Valley, and Delicate, they all featured pregnancies as a main plot element. And I'm sorry, but these three finales are the weakest finales of any AHF season by a long shot. I'm sure we could sit here and find more similarities, but my point is having one writer and that being an issue for the show is not a shocker, just look to double feature, and this decision should have been avoided at all costs. So we all remember the writer strike of last year, and what I'm about to say is just a theory of what I think was the motivation for having Hallie Pfeiffer be the sole writer and showrunner, but again, it's just a theory, so don't sue me or anything. But I think that FX and or Ryan Murphy were anticipating the writer strike early on in 2023, as many people in the industry were, as everybody knew that the contracts were expiring in the summer. So they planned this season to have a novel as its source material, and for it to have one sole writer and showrunner, so that they could have as clean of a writing process as possible as the industry moved into the potential writer strike. Stay with me here because last summer, after a few weeks of the writer strike, Disney sent out a very pointed letter to its writers, producers, and showrunners across all of their networks, ABC, Fox, FX, and everything else they own. And this letter both heavily suggested that writers resign from the WGA in order to continue writing for their projects, but they also laid out some provisions where producers and showrunners were expected to make script revisions that would not break the WGA rules for the strike. The WGA, though, felt like some of the things laid out in Disney's email definitely did violate the strike rules, but clearly Disney thinks they are above those rules. But essentially, since Hallie Pfeiffer was the showrunner as well as the sole writer, she could be on set and make script revisions while the strike was going on. This wouldn't be the case for a normal AHS writer's room of about 6 to 10 people, because they would not all have producer credits like Hallie Pfeiffer does. Whether or not these scripts were in violation of the writer's strikes, we will never know because clearly there are some discrepancies within the studio versus the WGA and everything on that set was kept so tight-lipped that if, if there was any gray area of overstepping these boundaries, I highly doubt they would ever come to light. And if you watch these two videos of mine from last summer, you know that the production for this season was incredibly messy, so these precautions against the writer's strike didn't really pay off. But if, say, they had hired a full writer's room and then had to lose that entire writer's room when the strike began during the second week of production on Delicate, I bet a lot more eyes would have been on those scripts to know what shape they were in before the strike versus how they ended up on screen, if you're picking up what I'm putting down. 
Again, this is all just the theory I had witnessing this all go down over the past year, and my stance on the strikes as a whole remains where it was a year ago. They should have delayed season 12. Just like Double Feature was largely sabotaged by the circumstances of the pandemic, Delicate was majorly sabotaged by the writer's strike, and of course, the actor's strike, which caused production to stop for all those months. But when the writer's strike first happened, FX and Ryan Murphy had a choice, and they chose to be one of only a handful of productions to continue filming during the writer's strike. And they put every cast and crew member on this season in the uncomfortable position to either cross picket lines or quit working on the show. You know, speaking of the strike, I have to ask, is everybody getting coffee with the people that you ran into on the picket line? You said you would. And now you have to. And now with the entire season in hindsight, I can say for certain that the season did feel incomplete, disjointed, and rushed due to all of these circumstances that I have just laid out. And that really sucks because the season did have a lot of genuine potential. Another thing that I think ended up weighing this season down artistically was the choice to cast Kim Kardashian as the main antagonist. She had some good moments for sure when she was delivering her one-liners or being intensely cruel, but her performance was definitely lacking when it came to some of the heavier and darker places the role required her to go. Obviously though, I do think the Kardashian factor is what accounted for a good amount of the success of the season, in that it did build upon the premiere of NYC and it seems to be generating a lot more conversation than NYC. But as you know from my Death of American Horror Story video, NYC was promoted like complete dog shit. So that's also on the promotion of that season versus this season, which was promoted much heavier. That's another story. But at the end of the day, Delicate was a more successful numerical season than NYC was. And I do think a lot of that had to do with her being in it. But I just can't help to imagine a world where Siobhan was played by someone who can really deliver both lightness and darkness. And my dream casting for the role would have been Dominique Jackson. But heck, even actors in this season proved that they could have ate that role up too, like Cara Delevingne or Michaela J. Rodriguez. And while we're on the topic, I would love to know what Kim Kardashian got paid for this role. Just to compare it to what Angelica Ross revealed she got paid for playing a similar role of the main antagonist in both parts of Double Feature. But back to the episode, I've been praising a lot of the visuals this season, but even in that department, this episode felt like a letdown. And that's mainly because the two main locations in this episode were so drab and harsh on the eyes that it just caused the episode to just feel oddly separated from the rest of the season. And it just didn't look good to me, but again, completely subjective. But speaking of visuals, the season had two cinematographers. Andre Schwartz was responsible for episodes 1, 4, 5, 8, and 9, and Tim Norman shot episodes 2, 3, and 7. And they both definitely did some remarkable work in those episodes. Watching the finale though felt like I was watching what potential was left for this season fall through my fingers like sand, and I would argue that Ave Hestia served as a better finale to the season. Sure, it left a lot of questions unanswered, but the questions it did answer were done so much more satisfyingly than in this episode which too left a lot of unanswered questions. The episode was also very absurd and at times grotesque in a way that the rest of the season hasn't been. Dex's death scene was a bit underwhelming because, well, he could still be breathing through his nose and she definitely didn't shove the hand down far enough to block his windpipes, so how exactly did he die? And then of course what little is left of Dex makes an appearance towards the end of the episode, which I don't think any of us needed to see. And Siobhan's death was like watching a car wreck. I could not look away as much as I wanted to. I like can't even put it into words. And also the set piece with the 15 babies and the organs hanging from the ceiling. Not only was it confusing to look at, but I've gotta ask, was the coven simultaneously gaslighting 15 other women at the same time as Anna? Is that who these babies are, or do these creatures never age up from infancy? Either way, I definitely needed more context and backstory on the creatures themselves, especially the ones in this room, and I also was dumbfounded that they never revealed to us what the creatures looked like. 
Once again, they only showed us its hand, which we already saw all the way back in episode four. You would think that the finale would have been the time to reveal a bit more about these creatures. I could write it off as a reference to how the baby isn't seen in that pivotal scene in Rosemary's Baby, but in this show, not seeing the baby doesn't have the same effect since we've seen so much else about the coven and heard so much about these creatures being described. Also, did they wait till the last episode to reveal to us that they changed the character of Io Preacher from the book's name to Mavis Preacher? Or did I miss that earlier in the season? Because that threw me for a loop because Io is a much better name for this character than Mavis. Like, why would you even change that from the book? To wrap things up, I did not like the direction that this finale went by having the episode largely consist of Siobhan exposition dumping on Anna in some visually uninspired settings, and I think not having more flashbacks explaining the unanswered questions of this season was definitely a mistake. The conclusion of this season definitely puts a damper on the things that it did have going for it, but the MVPs of the season as a whole are, are definitely actors Julie White, Deborah Monk, Michaela J. Rodriguez, Annabelle Dexter Jones, and Cara Delevingne, just a single out of few, as well as costume designer Jacqueline Demetrio and cinematographers Andre Schwartz and Tim Norman, and I did love getting to see the inner workings of a more sinister coven than that of season three, even if we only got to see it for only one episode. So in the end, Delicate did not pack a big punch, but it was certainly an entertaining ride that gave us some of the most outrageous moments in all of American Horror Story, so at least there's that. There you have it. Those are my final thoughts on American Horror Story Delicate. I want to thank all of you who have consistently tuned into my coverage of this season. It's really felt like old times. I'm sorry this individual review isn't more positive, but I'm just sharing my honest opinion, and this episode really was for the books, for all the wrong reasons. Be sure to keep your eyes peeled for another book to show comparison for part two of the season, which will be available to everyone at some point in the next week or if you want to become a member for just $1.99, it will be available this weekend. I've also got a second part of my Scream Queens video on the horizon, as well as some more coverage on some of my favorite horror properties, so subscribe for all of that. Give this video a like if you made it this far. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you then.